We start in the Dominican Republic, where the Venezuelan opposition has expressed its confidence that the dialogue with the government will continue. Opposition representative Luis Florido told a Dominican Republic radio station that the government now agrees the opposition did not know the whereabouts of Oscar Perez and his armed group. He added that this new claim facilitates negotiations. Dominican Foreign Minister Miguel Vargas also confirmed the two parties are willing to collaborate and that a new date will be announced soon. One of the lead mediators for the talks, former Spanish Prime Minister Luis, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero, called on all sides and the EU to keep pushing for an agreement. The situation in Venezuela demands the greatest effort, the highest responsibility. I appeal to the international community. I appeal to all governments. I appeal to the European Union so they are up to the responsibility that's being presented and so they contribute, so the government and opposition are able to arrive at an agreement. The initial disagreement in the talks came as opposition parties in Venezuela have their last chance to register for this year's presidential election. So far, only one party has confirmed its participation. Our correspondent in Caracas, Freddie Gillingham, has more. The Venezuela's presidential election is set to be taking place this year. However, the opposition is looking more divided than ever. Let's just go back and recap last uh, December in 2017. Uh, the last election to take place in Venezuela, three of the main opposition parties, the First Justice Party, the Democratic Action and the Popular Will, all boycotted that vote. Well, today and yesterday was the last time that these uh, parties could re-register. Um, as a result of that boycott, the ANC uh, did set up a new re-verification process that these parties who boycotted that vote needed to um, undergo. Uh, today and yesterday are, like I said, the last days they can register. The uh, Democratic Action is the only party out of those three main parties that has uh, declared that they will be re-registering. This is all very confusing. Um, let's not forget that just yesterday, uh, during the dialogue in Santo Domingo, they can the opposition uh, cancelled those um, peace dialogues. So at the moment it's looking quite dubious. Um, however, the election still hasn't been uh, designated a date yet, but we'll just have to wait and see to see if the opposition manage to um, run. We thank Freddie Gillingham for that report. The development of Venezuela's Plan de la Patria, which is the government's blueprint for 2019 to 2025, continues to move forward. This national plan is being debated in all public assemblies all across the country. Proposals are registered online and the debates will continue until the end of January. These young people are building their own home. This is part of the Grand Mission Bibienda de Venezuela initiative to build a worthy self-made home on reclaimed land. In this case, the building is 90% ready. When it's finally done, 23 families will live here. Turning these types of social projects into law is one of the proposals for the 2019-2025 national plan. We need every country to gain awareness about what self-management really means and how to organize with your neighbors without relying on the state, without relying on government, but on our own organizational skills to build our homes. Through organizing, we can achieve all of our dreams for the future, for our kids and our families. So here we are, a self-managed organization with revolutionary principles based on humility, unity and fighting spirit. Public assemblies for proposing additions to the national plan are taking place in every neighborhood and district. Initiatives from the People's Movement were taken directly to Caracas Mayor, and among the most important requests is to build productive and autonomous communities. The means and work ethic used to build this beautiful communal work must be established as one of the principal inclusions to the 2019-2025 national plan. Debates for the national plan's development are taking place all over Venezuela, and all proposals stay registered in the national plan's official website. Thursday to Saturday, we'll see three days of intense work to debate issues for the international agenda, which the government says must always stand in defense of Venezuela's sovereignty.
We must talk about the entire plan, and international relations intersect with most of it. If we talk about independence, what do we mean? If we talk about safeguarding lives, what do we mean? Everything relates to the world at large. The construction of socialism goes through international, economic, political, and social relations. We are not promoting an amalgamation of ideas. What is happening is an integration of ideas. This is not a rhetorical exercise. Committing assemblies has political, educational, and conscientious significance. What is being debated in the assemblies is not a game. It will be the fundamental premise of the plan. The economy will be the plan's linchpin with the most important topics being how to combat the perceived economic war being waged against the country and ways to develop the petro as the basis for Venezuela's financial system. We now go live to Lima, Peru, where Pope Francis continues with his visit. Just a few minutes ago, the Pope met Peruvian President Pedro Pablo Kaczynski, and they both spoke outside the government palace. The Pope highlighted the need to include the poorest in every government plan so that Peru could become a country of hope and opportunities are available for all and not just for a few. He also spoke about the degradation of the environment and the abuse of extractivism in the Amazon. He says it's not possible without moral degradation. In the next few hours, Pope Francis is expected to meet with several authorities like ministers, congressmen, and other political leaders. And that was live pictures from Lima. And Pope Francis spelt, spent his first full day in Peru in the southeastern city of Puerto Maldonado, where he took the opportunity to address environmental destruction in the country. Pope Francis defended the right of indigenous groups to protect their land while visiting a region of the Peruvian Amazon, known for its pristine rainforest and incredible biodiversity. The native Amazonian peoples have probably never been so threatened on their own lands as they are at present. The Amazon is a territory that is being disputed on many fronts. On the one hand, pressure being exerted by great business interests, seeking petroleum, gas, lumber and gold. This southeast region of Peru, known as Madre de Dios, has suffered unregulated resource exploitation that had led to attacks and in some cases the killing of indigenous tribe members. The pontiff points out that these acts are being driven by business interests. The threat against the territories also comes from the perversion of several policies that promote conservation without considering humans. Thousands of indigenous people from more than 20 groups came to greet Pope Francis in Puerto Maldonado. Amazon communities hope the pontiff can encourage the government to give back their territories. Francis, the natives of Peru's Amazon are survivors of many cruel and unjust acts. Our, our indigenous brothers from various Amazon regions suffer because of the exploitation of many of our natural resources. They are also worried this will eventually lead to the demise of their tribes. The outsiders see us as weak people and insist in taking away our territory in different ways. If they succeed in taking away our lands, we might disappear. During his visit, Pope Francis will also meet with indigenous people from communities of Bolivia and Brazil who have traveled to Peru to meet with him. As the Pope continues his tour of Peru, a comment he made in Chile is now stirring controversy. L take a listen. The day that they bring me proof against Bishop Barros, then I will speak. There is no one bit of proof against Barros. All of it is a slander. Is that clear? The Pope was defending Bishop Juan Barros who he appointed in 2015 to head a small diocese in Chile. Barros has been accused of protecting a priest who was found guilty in 2011 of abusing teenage boys. And Trinidad and Tobago has elected its first female president. Justice Paula May Weeks was elected unopposed by the country's electoral college, which is made up of select members of the government and the opposition. 
Weeks will be officially sworn in in March when the current president, Anthony Carmona's term ends. In Trinidad and Tobago, the role of the president is mostly ceremonial. Day-to-day -day governance is done by the prime minister. And Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Keith Rowley, and opposition leader Kamala Prasad Bissasa, in a rare moment of cooperation, praise the election of the first female head of state. Madam Speaker, as a young nation, we can indeed be proud of the fact that our democracy and all our governance systems are open to all our citizens. Equity at all levels will enhance our democracy and ensure that our nation achieves its true potential. So who is Justice Paula May Weeks? Well, she'll be the first female president of Trinidad and Tobago. Justice Weeks received her LLB in 1980 and soon moved into a career that focused on criminal and appellate law. She became a High Court judge in 1996 and has acted as Chief Justice of Trinidad and Tobago. Currently, she's a judge at the Tiggs and Caicos, Caicos Court of Appeal, a three-year term that began in February last year, but it's a position she will have to resign to become President of Trinidad and Tobago. An inventory carried out in Dominica by the University of Twenty has revealed that almost 10,000 landslides were triggered by Hurricane Maria, which hit the island in September last year. According to the findings, over 8,500 were debris slides, while a little over 1,000 were debris flows. The study warns that the island will be facing more problems with landslides in the coming years. And we have more news in a minute, so stay with us. The discovery of the remains of 33 people in clandestine gra graves in the state of Nayarit has shaken Mexico, a country where the number of missing people is in the tens of thousands. To the west of the Mexican Republic in the Nayarit state, there are newfound clandestine graves. We are at a very important stage that involves looking at every bone that has been found. A total of 33 skulls and 200 bones. While this went on in the Zalisco municipality in Mexico City, mothers looking for their missing children have started a hunger strike outside the Attorney General's office. The Attorney's office has refused to accept our complaints, and that's why more people have disappeared because the state prosecutors are colluding with organized crime. The mothers represent organizations in search of all of those missing over the country. They denounce the lack of personnel and resources assigned to the search. It's been the mothers themselves who have found most of the clandestine graves in 23 states. Roberto Quiroa Flores. Presente! Nosotros como padres de familia. As parents in a nationwide collective, it's us who are in the fields looking for our children. They don't even care that it's not them who are finding these graves. They're known as searchers, and many of them have even become certified forensic experts to take part in the investigations. Nonetheless, they say that without official help to identify the bodies, their job can't be completed. The bodies we've recovered from clandestine graves go to the pauper's grave. No DNA testing is being done. Over the past 10 years, over 1,000 500 clandestine graves have been found in Mexico. Searchers and human rights defenders have said this is the likely destination of over 30,000 missing people, registered since the start of the so-called war against drug trafficking by former President Felipe Calderon. The opposition alliance in Honduras has called for a week-long general strike from Saturday in the run-up to the swearing-in of President Juan Orlando Hernandez on the 27th. 
Human rights defenders have denounced an excessive repression of the protests against alleged fraud in November's elections. Human rights defenders in Honduras have denounced a new national security doctrine that includes the jailing, disappearing and killing of people. It is a reality that a national security doctrine exists, a new system to detain people that we really don't know where are being taken. The activists also denounced the disproportionate use of police forces and repression during the demonstrations that have taken place. They are worried that this could increase during the national strike set to start on the next days. We alert the nation and international community about the increase of human rights violations and that this can still happen during the national strike. That will take place from the 20th to the 27th of January. The human rights defenders said that the police forces have a list of names to be killed. It is not strange that they have a list of names of who the government considers enemies. The state wants to repress, torture and kill. Meanwhile, the coordinator of the opposition alliance said they always thought violence could happen since the government intimidates the people. I don't have a doubt that they do it. And let me tell you that the demonstrations will continue. We are not stopping anything. For the National Defenders Group, the dialogue proposed by Juan Orlando Hernández can only happen if he admits he committed electoral fraud. Ecuadorian Pais Alliance member Marcela Aguinaga has resigned from the party as part of a group of local authorities who are stepping down as a result of the political dispute between President Lenin Moreno and former president and party founder Rafael Correa. Via her Twitter account, Aguinaga said, I submit my formal resignation from Pais Alliance and my resignation as provincial director of a party that no longer represents the great majority and that has become synonymous with treason, opportunism, and disloyalty. Brazilian legal experts claim that there are irregularities in the legal process that sentence former president Luiz Ignacio Lula de Silva to nine years in prison for bribery and corruption. Law professors of the University of Brasilia held a conference to talk about the lack of evidence in the trial. They also accused Judge Sergio Moro of bias and said he sentenced Lula in a previous trial. The main evidence in which Judge Moro based his legal decision on is the testimony of Leo Pinheiro. Every detail and legal element of Lula's case was based on this testimony. In order to give a sentence, you need other kinds of evidence. Days before the second ruling against Lula de Silva, the former president met with artists and intellectuals who have been in support of his possible candidacy. Ignacio Limas and Julian Nassif report from Sao Paulo. Lula da Silva addressed artists and intellectuals as well as leaders of social movements, trade unions and political parties. The former president says the future of Brazil hinges on this ruling. What's at stake is more than just Lula. It's something called national sovereignty. On January 24th, Three judges of the Tribunal Court of Porto Alegre can vote to prevent Lula from being a candidate or even send him to jail. What is at stake in Porto Alegre is not if Lula will go to jail. What is at stake is if democracy in Brazil will be restricted. Even those who normally wouldn't vote for Lula participated in the event because they considered that an election without Lula would be a fraud, while his supporters insist that acquitted or not, Lula will be their candidate. The electoral process of 2018 will not be democratic if Lula cannot participate. He can't be forced not to participate. He has the right to do so. Nothing seems to stop Lula from fighting for a country which has already sent him to prison for 31 days during the military dictatorship, a coup attempt against his party and the loss of his wife. It is a continuity of a COP to implement a long-term agenda of destruction of social rights in the country. The state, the library of Petrobras, Bank of Brazil, 
national breaches and natural resources and destruction of labor rights. Regardless of the ruling on January 24th, Lula will be received by a demonstration in Sao Paulo. It is a moment of recognition for our people and we cannot stay outside of this fight. The black movement and militants, we have to be in the streets. Lula starts 2018 disputing the election in the tribunal and in the streets. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. California's Attorney General reminded state workers that they can be fined $10,000 for revealing information to immigration agents under a new state law. At the beginning of this year, a new law turned California into a sanctuary state, the first in the country. The bill forbids public officials from giving information about their employees to federal authorities. It also prohibits businesses from voluntarily providing data to immigration officials or allowing them to take information without a court order. Hundreds of Haitian immigrants took to the streets of New York to protest against Donald Trump's racist comments on Caribbean countries. On the eve of Donald Trump's first anniversary in office, about 200 protesters braved the cold in New York to protest against what they deemed were racist remarks made by the U.S. president. That's after Trump referred to Haiti, El Salvador, and African nations as shithole countries. Protesters carrying Haitian flags, signs, and banners chanted as they walked across the Brooklyn Bridge and marched towards the Trump building. This is not acceptable and people have to take to the streets and say this is not what this country is. We will never allow it to be. And if you don't stand up now, they will be after you next. His comments have sparked worldwide condemnation, especially from citizens and politicians in Africa, South America and the Caribbean. Because I'm Haitian and I'm standing for um, all the Haitian immigrants and I'm standing for what we believe in and I'm standing for my children and I'm standing for all my ancestors. Demonstrations erupted in Haiti as well, where throngs of people gathered outside the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince. The Haitians are also unhappy that Trump revoked special status given to about 59,000 Haitian immigrants in the U.S. When we consider war, exploitation, domination, occupation, coups, and racism, there are so many weapons used by the United States against the countries of the Caribbean and Africa. U.S. foreign policy on Haiti never changed. It's been that way for 200 years. 200 years of policy that appeared to have changed in just one year. Mexico has refuted claims from the U.S. President Donald Trump that it, that it is the most dangerous country in the world. In a statement, the foreign ministry said, even though Mexico has a significant problem with violence, it's plainly false that Mexico is the most dangerous country in the world. Mexico has a murder rate of about 19 per 100,000 inhabitants. The World Bank says that's below other Latin American countries. And US President Donald Trump has addressed the March for Life anti-abortion rally in Washington. Trump says his administration will continue to push for an anti-abortion agenda during the rest of his term in office, and he will be rescinding an Obama-era Medicaid guideline that limits states in how they take action against medics who provide abortion services. Israeli forces continue to clash with people in Palestine. Our correspondent, Noah Harazin, has the latest from the Gaza. Today, clashes erupted between Palestinian youth and Israeli forces in several towns and cities around the West Bank. One of the biggest uh, clashes erupted in the um, city of East Jerusalem after thousands of Israeli settlers stormed into Al-Aqsa Mosque. The other big clash happened in the city of uh, Jenin when a group of Israeli vehicles raided the home of um, a Jarrar family in Jenin, uh, killing uh, one of the uh, 
uh, family members and arresting several uh, family members after they claimed that he was responsible for the killing of a settler on January the 6th. Here in the Gaza Strip, even though the situation on the ground is calm and peaceful, Israeli uh, forces continue violating the agreed Palestinian-Israeli ceasefire when attacking Palestinian fishermen of the coast of uh, Gaza shores even though they were fishing inside the six nautical miles limit the same thing happened in the eastern border between gaza and israel when israeli forces attacked palestinian farmers who were working inside their farms no injuries were reported in both incidents we thank no harazine for that report Turkish artillery forces fired into Syrian's Afrin region in what Ankara said was the start of a military campaign against the Kurdish control area. The cross-border bombardment took place after days of threats from Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan to crush the Syrian Kurdish YPG militia. Direct military action against territory held by Kurdish militia could open a new front in Syria's civil war. Living conditions for refugees in Greece are reaching critical levels. Our correspondent in Greece, Habai Abide, tells us more about the situation of refugees seeking asylum from other European countries. We're in Chios, in one of the islands close to Turkey. And you can see behind me the Turkish shore, specifically the city of Chesme, one of the areas where the most refugees have come from and where there is currently about 15 to 20 percent of refugees arriving by sea from Turkey. Here we can see the Frontex operation, an initiative of the EU frontier policy aimed at intercepting these arrivals. Pyal is one of the largest refugee camps in Greece. It can currently hold approximately 800 people, but now the population is three times that figure, to almost 2,000 people. This camp has seen a transformation in the last couple of months, its expansion hopefully guaranteeing a better facility for asylum seekers. Yesterday we confirmed that it is completely full. We can't show you images because police forbade us from filming telling us we didn't have a government permit, which we have requested on numerous occasions. Otherwise, it is impossible to film inside Vial. They confirmed that they haven't given out permits for any journalist in months. This raises concerns over the living conditions of some parts of the camps that we can't visit. These asylum seekers are here, not because they want to, but they intend to move to other areas, and they are passing by the islands to reach continental Greece. We will keep you updated. We thank Habai Abide for that report. And with that, we've come to the end of this evening's news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, telestudio.tv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telestudio English, I'm Sweeney Gray. And as the show ends, I'm leaving you with live images of the Pope in Lima. So thank you so much for watching.